We were just talking before we came on about the amount of people on our socials that don't realize that we're from Canada, uh, Ontario, Canada. I've been posting recently. We've had a lot of bad weather and we've had to cancel classes the last couple of days and uh, I see people talking away. Where would they live in order to have to cancel classes? Because yeah. so many of you who listen to us probably live in beautiful, warm places. But yeah. Canada is beautiful, but it is not always warm. Um, <laughs> the other thing we were just talking about that I think is worth sharing uh, with you is uh, we recently posted a reel or a clip or something, a short, yep. about uh, Puppy House Line. And uh, the amount of people that don't think they can use a puppy house line because their puppy chews on it is staggering. So it's important to know that if you're use, when you're using a house line in your puppy training, I know you're here, you're joining the train station, you get it, you're, you're trying to be proactive instead of reactive for all your puppy training problems. And we love that. But if your puppy is chewing on the house line, it's really important that you interrupt that behavior. Anytime your puppy's out of their kennel or crate and you're with them and they're in training, they should have a line on, even if it's an adult dog. You know, we've, Even if they're not in training. Yeah, well, right. Oh, you mean like the dog is in out yeah, training age? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, not even th the age. Like if the dog needs to learn, you know, if you're not really sure what result you're going to get, you're probably going to have a house line on them. If you're mm -hmm. not sure if they're going to get into trouble, you should probably have a house line. But when they chew on that house line, here's the good news. Because you're practicing good dog training, um, uh, what's the word? I'm like, not behavior, uh, good dog training, I don't know skills you're procedures gonna be, yeah procedures is great you're observing mm -hmm. them and when they start to chew on it you remove it we have all sorts of videos on the channel that talk about what to do next you remove <laughs> it from their mouth you get to redirect them a little bit and get give them something to do but don't take the house line off because you're going to run into all of the problems that you yes. had before it's magic that it, house line it's really quite it's truly remarkable i see um there's some people that have dropped we should say who we are sure yeah that's a good idea <laughs> Maybe that's a good we're point. Ju we're just so comfortable doing this. That's that sometimes the interesting. We yeah, that's the interesting thing about the YouTube channel is that we have 800 or something videos on the channel, and uh, maybe you've seen videos with like Instructor Shannon, Instructor Carol, Instructor Steve. Uh, I mean, Robbie. the list goes on and on. Yeah, Instructor Robbie, uh, and you're like, who on earth are these people? Why are they sitting in front of the in the train <laughs> station tonight? Uh, my name's Ken Steep. This is Kale McCann. We're professional dog trainers at McCann Dogs. And at McCann Dogs, every week we help nearly 600 dog owners to overcome the same dog training challenges that you have. Online, we're helping nearly 1,000 dogs every week. And since 1982, McCann Professional Dog Trainers has helped way more than 100,000 dogs mm -hmm. in the building. So um, we come to you with tips and advice to help you through the toughest part of the dog training process. Because when you... It, I'm, I'm a student. I, I'm, I was once a student. I went to McCann Dogs. I had this wild and crazy black Labrador retriever named Deegan. And I took her to the vet and she's just being a wild thing. And my vet said, listen, you have to head over to McCann Dogs over here. Um, you need to get some control. She needs to be able to listen. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I said, fine. And I went over and I, after like two lessons at McCann Dogs, I fell in love with dog training. I started to see the change, the progressions. And um, I was there all the time and I was there so much that they were like, hey, do you want to become an apprentice? And I said, absolutely, I do. <laughs> when I started my uh, training for the apprenticeship project, I met Kale, yes. who was the trainer of the trainers. <laughs> and um, uh, I fell in love with Kale. And long story Aww. short, now we're married. Cute. And now we're sitting in front of you here in the train station. This was a very long process, by the way. Hopping aboard the training train. <laughs> it was many years. But with that said, that's who we are. And mm. in tonight's show, uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about three steps that you can apply to every unwanted behavior to get some control over your dog training. It's funny, you know, we talk about the fact that if you fail to plan, then you plan to fail. And when you encounter some of these unusual things in your training, you're like, I just, I can't solve this. You're going to be able to take these three steps tonight, uh, look at that problem in a, in a different light, and start applying some of the tactics that we're going to talk about. But it just, this thing I love about the train station is we get to talk directly to you about a different way to think about your training so that yeah. no matter what the problem is that you can apply this stuff you can apply it during the show maybe you apply it right after the show maybe tomorrow morning your problem behaviors every morning you can start to use these tactics to have a well-behaved dog because we bring these dogs home and we have these aspirations of like i'm gonna go on walks we're gonna go hiking we're gonna go paddle boarding you know I, or i'm i'm gonna we're gonna sit on the couch and we're gonna watch netflix and the dog's just gonna be snoring away and you, you get, don't realize that it doesn't look like that at yeah, first and that's that it's right. a lot of work. Yeah, and you're like, what did I do? I, I shouldn't have got a dog. Well, I don't want you feeling like that. We're going to help you through the process. 
something you're going to see in our chat tonight, uh, which if you're watching on TV, which I know a lot of people do, especially for the live streams, is you need to open up your phone or a tablet or something like that so you can follow along in the chat. There's tons mm -hmm. of great value that you'll find there. It's also a great place for, for you to ask us questions. But if you take a look at the chat, you're going to notice some, some names in there that are blue. And if their name is in blue, they're part of the McCann Dogs crew. We see Instructor Shannon, Instructor Robbie. I saw Dan, lots of links looting. He's going to be dropping some links in the chat for you. But those are our moderators, also our trainers. And if their name's in green, they're part of the Heart Dog team. For mm -hmm. any of our Heart Dog supporters, their name is in green. It's, uh, you know, something that you, uh, uh, you know, subscribe to here on the YouTube channel. And it makes your question easy to see if you're a Heart Dog supporter. So, those are the, the two different, um, the two different uh, colored names that you're going to see in the chat. Now, something that I love to, I'm on a roll here. Yep. You okay there? Oh, oh I'm just yeah. sitting and enjoying. I'm on a roll. I'm feeling, because I'm feeling good about time. I like when you talk a lot at first because then I usually have to talk a lot second. That's so true. I'm relaxing. Something I love to do every single train station. We have students, from how many countries now? From like 60? Over 60, I think. Yeah, from 60 something countries all over the world that we get to work with on a weekly basis. But we have... Uh, st uh, viewers on YouTube from like way even more countries than that. So I love taking the opportunity to find out where you're joining the train station from. This is a train station roll call. So let us know where you're at. I like going after the show. Kelly and I go grab some dinner, maybe go catch a movie. I don't know. We just, we head out of the train station. We hop aboard the, the train to, to fun town and uh, we <laughs> figure out something to do. But something that I like doing is looking at all the different places you guys are joining us from. I was never good at geography in school. And I like looking at some of these cool little towns or maybe it's a country I've never heard of. So it, you drop it in the chat right now. It's the train drop station it. roll call. I'm gonna grab a drink while these t uh, towns come in. We have Washington, Georgetown, Texas, Ontario, Canada. Lee, you're nice and close. Maybe, yeah. maybe not. Uh, Philadelphia, Moody, Alabama. Oh, that's, that's an interesting Yeah, name. AL is Alabama, right? Yep. Yep. Uh, Melbourne, Australia. We have lots of Australian uh, students, actually. Bonnie Kraft, um, one of our Heart Dog supporters. Yes, Aurora, Ontario. Very nice. Anaheim, California. Ottawa, oh, cool. Central in Indiana. Uh, Lake Wales, Florida. Another person from UK. Northern Nevada. Awesome. Phoenix, Arizona. Oh, cool. Oh, there's all kinds uh, of says, London, UK. We've got lots of UKs tonight. Yeah. Awesome. One is from Wallandport. Her pup is sleeping. She can focus. <laughs> That's cool. So, okay. Casey True. and I are uh, MM members from a tiny town on the table lands of New South Wales, Australia. Good day, eh? Good well, day. That's fun. Aloha. Very cool. They're monthly members, uh, part of our uh, online training program as well. Cool. Very cool. So, if, you, if you've been working through some kind of... Uh, dog training problem. We've got three tips that's going to help you solve them in tonight's episode. I'm what? Ken Steep. I'm Cal McCann. Welcome back to McCann Dogs. I slipped a good little rhyme in there. She didn't catch it. Oh, I was still looking at all the uh, locations. I like doing those uh, because they're so ridiculous. And, uh, you know, it's funny to me. And then I usually roll my eyes. Usually you do. Which... You can, I can actually hear you roll your eyes. That's oh. how much you roll your eyes. Wow. Um, okay. Let's talk a little bit about unwanted behaviors. You know, sometimes uh, these things... Uh, oh, Instructor Alexis. I didn't see Instructor Alexis in there. We've got our, like, side uh, chat going on with our moderator and trainer. Or oh, Lexi Lulu. Sorry, Lex. Didn't see you in there. She's my favorite. And Sue K says... Oh. <laughs> this is the most tooting. Oh, I didn't do very good because I literally covered the hole. still pretty good. Whatever. Uh, this, you're, you'll never see more tooting than on our live shows. Uh, <laughs> it's remarkable. I didn't even know they allowed so much shooting on YouTube. Yeah, well, I think they allow a lot of things on YouTube. Let's talk a little bit about unwanted behaviors in dog training when maybe you discover, maybe you don't discover. I saw some great uh, suggestions for uh, some of the skills that we're going to talk about tonight from our people in the chat. Um, if you have one unwanted behavior, a training problem that you're really struggling with, drop it in the chat and we might have a chance to talk specifically about your situation. But um, there are lots of things that people find really frustrating with their dog training and they continue to struggle with it because they don't really have a strategy for fixing it. And I get it. I was, I've been there. I just didn't know what to do. But when I learned the McCann method, especially, you know, the more I worked with other students when I became an instructor, when I worked with other students, I'd see myself in the things that they were doing. Mm -hmm. And having a strategy or a game plan is crucial. 
Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the three steps to solving these kinds of problems and, and, and sort of like, you know, high level r really quickly. Uh, there's three steps that you're going to be thinking about tonight. We're going to be talking about these from sort of different angles, but uh, foundation and fairness, timing, and consistency. Those are the three things that we're going to be thinking about as we apply mm -hmm. them to each of our problem behaviors. Um, Let's talk a little bit about what foundation and fairness means as it relates to puppy training or dog training. Mm -hmm. And then um, then we can start to apply it to like specific uh, situations. Yeah. So basically foundation and fairness is um, making sure that before you truly get frustrated with a behavior, you need to consider whether you've actually done the foundation training that is deserved in order to help that behavior. Because what happens often with unwanted behaviors is at first, dogs do unwanted behaviors because they literally don't know any better. Puppies, sometimes dogs do, it doesn't really matter the age, it just depends on what they know. Um, they are not doing it out of spite or any other reason other than they simply don't know that a better option or that a different option is better. So the foundation is really important. The second thing is that the dogs will eventually get to the point where maybe they have learned a skill, but they're testing your leadership a little bit and they're choosing not to do it because they're being a little bit bratty. That sometimes happens when they turn into adolescents. And if you have a good foundation set on whatever skill it is that, um, that you're looking to achieve, you're able to get the dog back on track much more easily, but um, that's the foundation. And the fairness is sort of goes along with that because it's not really fair to be frustrated with the dog for not doing something when you haven't trained the dog to do that thing. Um, and sometimes we forget that dogs aren't born or they don't come to us knowing how to walk on a loose leash. Like walking on a loose leash down a street with distractions is not a natural reaction for a dog to just let a squirrel run past them and not chase it. Yeah. That's not a natural reaction right. for a dog. When they're excited to see people jumping up, that's a very natural reaction for a dog. It would be, it's very odd for a dog not to react. And not to say that some dogs are a little bit more docile or chill and they don't care about those things. There are those dogs out there, but the majority of the dogs just react very naturally like a dog to some of these things. And the only way that they learn not to make those natural choices, which some of them are really irritating to us. Um, the only way that they don't do it is if we actually take the time to teach them not to. So we have to remember that we can't get frustrated if we haven't done the, uh, if we haven't set the tone, haven't set the expectation, the foundation yet. Yeah. Okay. Timing. Let's talk about timing and why that's so important when it comes to stopping the unwanted behaviors. You know, timing is the uh, is an, is a pillar of dog training. It's one of it's probably the most important thing that most people get wrong mm -hmm. when it comes to dog training. And with bad timing, you're going to become dependent on food. You're going to confuse your dog. You're going to demotivate your dog. And those are things that you do not want to do when you have a young dog who's just kind of figuring out hmm, is this person worth listening to? Mm -hmm. Because the moment you get, you tip the scales away from you, uh, you have a whole other set of problems to deal with. And in addition to making them think whether you're worth listening to, also, are you confusing them? Because sometimes yeah. if your timing is off and you're not delivering your information clearly to your dog, they'll react either with confusion and get a little bit worried or unsure and they'll disconnect from you. Or some dogs are like, you don't know what you're doing. Woohoo, I'm gonna go find something else to do and yeah. party on. Yeah. Um, and then they really don't care about, about what you have to say. So timing is so important. I'm sure if you've watched our channel before, you probably have heard us talk about the timing, um, learning time frame of a dog, which is one second. And that goes for when you're delivering information to your dog that they're correct. That goes from when they're uh, incorrect. That goes from when you should be giving cues. Everything needs to happen sort of right, right away with the dog in order for them to actually comprehend. And the thing that is so challenging about timing is that because you have to be so quick to react to things, a lot of times we end up reinforcing things that we don't mean to yeah. because we don't really understand how timing works works or we're going to get into the next thing which is consistency or we're not we're not clear and consistent with the information um you know if you're allowing your dog to rehearse something over and over and over again and on the 11th or 12th time you finally do something about it well your timing's off and so the dog says well 
I did it for 11 times. So why, why are all of a sudden you upset with me now? So um, timing is so, so uh, important in order for the dogs to understand. And we have to remember that dogs learn um, very differently than a, than a person does. They live in the moment. You know, I could, teaching you as a human, I could go back and say, hey, last Wednesday at seven o'clock, remember when you did this? Right. Well, you should have done that. And then you could do this differently. And you would understand that. Dogs don't have a clue about that. They live in the moment and they basically do what it's rewarding to them and they don't repeat what isn't rewarding to them. Mm -hmm. it, it, it really, it, it's so simple that it's actually hard for people to grasp how to actually give clear information uh, to a dog, which is why so many people struggle with it. I think, uh, yeah, and getting back to your point, I, I, that's such an important thing for you to remember at home, but getting back to your point about, um, oh shoot, I lost it, darn. Um, Getting back to your point about, oh, we've got to convince the dogs. Mm -hmm. You know, dogs come into this world with very dog-like behaviors, and we've got to figure out how to teach them to live in a human world, because that's our expectation. Um, so the things that are naturally rewarding to them, there's value there. It doesn't matter whether mm -hmm. you're involved or not. Things like yeah. barking can be super... Uh, Digging. Uh, yeah, feels good. Chewing. Chasing. Jumping. Those, those things feel good to the dog. And at that, with, in an absence of information, if it feels good, it's the right thing thing. Mm -hmm. So we need to intervene because we don't want our dogs digging up the flower bed. We don't want our dogs barking at the window constantly. We don't want our dogs chewing on our shoe, even though it might taste delicious to them. Mm -hmm. We have to show them what the, how to live in this human world. So you are, you have your, um, you know, your work cut out for you. And looking at this, with a strategic approach is exactly what's gonna make your work so much easier. It's no different than when we talk about skills in our puppy program or our, our life skills program. Mm -hmm. You know, having some sort of, some steps to follow when it comes to teaching a skill or undoing a, a problem behavior, it's, it's you know, uh, it makes a big difference when you have strategy. So I've grabbed a couple of the uh, problem behaviors that we've um, talked about or, or people that have, uh, Put in the chat, uh, if you drop a super chat, we'll see uh, it more easily. It actually moves it up to the top of our list, but it's, I've grabbed a couple that I really like. From First one's from Joanna. Jumping up, and let's talk about that. Crate barking is a little bit separate, but let's talk about the specifics of jumping up and break it down into the three points of training. So we'll start with foundation and fairness with, uh, with jumping up. Um, Ken had mentioned that jumping up is, or maybe I mentioned, I can't remember, one of us said that jumping up is a very natural, um, a natural thing for a dog to do, and it's very rewarding. Um, that could be jumping up on people, or that could be jumping up on your furniture and stealing things yeah. and, you know, grabbing that, you know, thawing meat off of the counter. Right. Think about how rewarding that is, it's double whammy. Number one, jumping's fun. Number two, that thawing meat's delicious. Um, so that's where the the um, the reward comes in. The foundation and fairness part of it is that we need to teach our dogs about how to not jump up. What the, what should they do instead? And really, the only per, the only way to do that is by um, is by setting our dog up to know what to do differently. And that's gonna be done through really good supervision. Yeah. We also suggest, um, I think Ken mentioned this at the top of the show, uh, about using a house line or something like that um, in, on the dog so that if they go to do something like jump up on somebody or something, we have a way of actually stopping the dog without actually grabbing the dog themselves and making it turn into a bit of a game. That's the thing with jumping up specifically is um, if the dog jumps up and people push the dog off or if they turn away and the dog gets to jump up and bite at your sleeves and just have a party, that's sort of, you know, very rewarding to them. So they want to keep doing it. So we need to stop that from happening in the first place. So there's two ways you're going to go about it. Number one, you're going to use the leash of the line. You could step on it with your foot to stop the jumping up. You could take the leash in your hand and um, lifted the leash up to get your dog to sit uh, and you also could do even one better and that would be 
prevent the jumping from happening in the first place. Right. So it w- just sort of just, just to slow you down a little bit because I want to make sure it's really uh, super clear. So we've talked a little bit about the foundation. So you've started, you've set yourself up for, um, you've taught your dog that maybe a sit is the, the right uh, thing to do. I haven't you, talked about that yet, but okay. yes. So let's talk, let's just break it down just like this. Rather than actually treating the behavior or, or like working through the problem, let's see if we can break it down into three steps. So the foundation of this skill is that you've maybe shown your dog that there's value in sitting in, in position. You're starting to show them you're, you're using great management techniques by having a line on them and you're, uh, you've got a foundation, you've got a way to manage them. You know, if you don't have some way to manage them, then they're going to be gratified by jumping up on another person. And you're being fair. You're knowing that your dog is probably going to jump up on this stranger. So you're not putting them, them in that position. It's so important that you aren't overfacing your dog with challenges as we introduce them to like new things in the world. And if you don't know what the result's gonna be, you're not gonna put them in that position. I know Kale's like dog trainer brain is like, okay, let's like knock off these 10 things. Uh, but I really wanna like just slow it down a little bit. What, let's talk about timing. Like where does the time, why, why I'll, I'll, I'll get us started. So timing, your dog's gonna indicate to you that they're about to jump. You know, there's going to be like this moment where there's like a hesitation or there's like a little, uh, co- almost like a coiling. We talked about this a lot with like jumping up on counters. Mm-hmm. And you're much more likely to affect change when you interrupt the behavior before it happens, when they're about to do something. Your dog's going to think that you're a psychic. They're like, how did you even know? It told me to off. I didn't, that's amazing. So timing is really important. If you're too late, that's you're managing. You know, it's like reactive dog training. But when we're introducing this skill, which you might need, I mean, maybe your dog surprises you, jumps up on somebody, and you have to use that leisure line that we talked about in the foundation, and you're going to guide them off. But timing is so important when it comes to jumping up training. You know, you really need to know, I don't know, maybe like even when to get your dog, what that, we talk a lot about those circles, like where you're definitely going to fail, you're, you're likely going to fail, and then like a circle where you're safe. Your, your dog is not going to jump up. You need to sort of see the world through your dog's eyes. When does it get so enticing to jump up that I can't help myself? And then you need to create some distance from that. Mm-hmm. And the consistency part of it as well, like if you have a, a dog that likes to jump up, and this is a comment that's more specific to people, is you need to be ready to to be consistent So um, and to ha- have good timing. So if you have a dog that you know is prone to making that mistake, you need to be ahead of the game. Um, you know, we recently have a puppy. He's a, a year old now, so he's, his jumping is vastly improve from when he was a puppy but you know when I was out and about and I would see him start to get wiggly and get excited to see people I would automatically get some food out lure him into a sit start rewarding him for sitting I was consistent about doing that and by repeating here's a person that you're excited about when you sit you get lots of treats and then guess what that person comes over and they say hi to you it's it's so so fun to sit and not jump Um, consistently practicing that the dog were was able to put two and two together that you know this sitting on a loose leash is actually more valuable than jumping because not only do you still get to you know get greeted by somebody and get pet which is what the ultimate um, goal for the dog is um, they're also getting some rewards as well so um, I find sometimes what people do is they they don't have the training on the brain and then they sort of allow their dogs to get into situations where it's really easy for them to rehearse a poor choice and then they're fumbling for the treat so they don't have the leash on and they're just not ready for the things and then that whole consistency thing just flies out the window because the dog's still able to squeak in a few poor choices in there simply because the person's not being consistent and they're not ready to train through it but if you're a little bit more um, uh, aware of what the dog possibly could do in different scenarios you can treat it with better consistency and you can be ready to give your dog better information and then you're going to fix your problem faster rather than doing a little bit and then having a whole bunch of reps of it not going well and then having some success if you're consistent you're going to actually power through that skill really quickly because dogs are much smarter than we give them credit for suke uh speaks to that a little bit suke says I struggled to get the timing right uh, in, in terms of seeing what happens just before he jumps. Reading the pup's body language was hard for me. Yeah, that can be hard. And it, yeah, and it's probably going to be hard for you. We get to see all kinds of dogs every single week. And as a new dog owner, you're going to have to be really aware of what your dog is doing. And then you're going to start to see some patterns. Mm-hmm. You're going to start to see the, the things that happens just before. You know, the other thing, and I, this is a little bit unrelated to jumping up on people, but um, something that you'll see if you think your dog's going to jump up on a counter is air scenting. They'll yeah. put their little nose in the air. and 
or they'll stand like stock still and they're like, oh, what's going on up here? Uh, and that's, they'll even stand up on their back legs like a prairie dog. That's right. That's true. Depending <laughs> on the size of the dog, for sure. That's the point when you can uh, interrupt with that off. Uh, command. You can give them information so that they haven't failed yet, but you're like so aware and you're way more likely to be successful at that point. It's a lot easier than when you have a dog that can jump up on the counters. Uh, it's easier than like taking that dog off of the counters, regardless of how whippity or cute he is. Even you're not, how high he you're not talking about my adorable, perfect little puppy, are you? Never. I would never. Just love them so much. Um, Kia, dropping the super sticker. Thank you very much. And Kia asks, um, Hello, I'm a first time dog owner at 44 years old, life skills student. You've literally been my one stop shop for raising my five month old Shih Tzu nice. since day one, bringing her home. Question, because I hold Su Suji, uh, instead of having her on the ground most of the time, the scenario I am dealing with is not jumping up, but hyper in my arms. Mm. Um, so uh, next, I guess, follow up. What are the right steps to develop her being totally calm in my arms with others, treats, target distancing, and both feel awkward as I'm holding her. So what's the foundation of this? Mm -hmm. What's the foundation of this skill? And like, what's fair to expect of her? Um, with a small dog, I, I actually don't think it's a, a bad idea to hold them in your arms sometimes because it does um, allow them to feel a little safer. But sometimes when they're up there, little dogs are like, "Woo! look at how high I am. I yeah. don't get to be up here very often. And then they sometimes get overconfident or wiggly and silly, which it kind of sounds like your puppy is doing. Um, so I would definitely suggest um, you can use some treats for sure. But in some cases, what is that noise? Okay. Some, I, thought so, I, thought, I thought a dog was uh, choking on something for some reason. Sorry. Small panic attack. Um, Sam, we're in the middle of a live stream. Can you sweep out the uh, <laughs> studio later? Okay, we're good. You are so weird. Um, sometimes with some dogs, treats can make them calmer and some dogs, treats can make them more excited. So just, I, I'm hesitant to say treats is the answer because yeah. dogs react to it differently, but it certainly could be an option to reward your dog and get them more focused on you. But just note that some dogs, um, will get more excited with it. Um, what I would really work on is you being able to get your dog to settle in your arms. And we teach something in our puppy essentials course, actually, um, called a uh, collar and body hold. And basically what we do is slip our hand in the collar and we snug the dog quite snugly against our body and we just sort of hold them. And when you do that, a lot of dogs will wiggle, wiggle, wiggle. And then that embrace kind of calms the dog a little bit. And when they sort of go, okay, I'm holding here, then we could say yes and either reward or we could place the dog down or we could change what we were doing. Um, I, I don't know if you guys know, but we have a little toy poodle named Hippie Shake. And um, she's adorable. She is so cute. And she can she can be still a bit of a wild woman in, in yeah. a fun, loving way. Yeah. Um, but one of the things that I've done with her since a puppy to get her to be a bit more calm is that collar and body hold. And she's 10 years old. And I think that hold is her favorite place to be now when I yeah. hold her. As soon as I hold her, get her into that spot, she puts her head right underneath my neck and she nuzzles right in and she relaxes almost immediately. And that's from when she was younger, me snugging her in and doing that hold to get her to settle. And then when she would relax, I would release my tension a little bit. And again, we're not hurting the dog, we're not squashing the dog or anything like that. We're just sort of snugging the dog Embracing in them. and um, giving them a tight embrace, getting them to settle. Um, so that's something that I would suggest that you do. So the foundation for that is essentially starting to teach your dog that it's okay that it's you know relaxing comfortable to yeah. be in your arms without it's, any distractions around so you yeah, would do that exactly. exercise without any without anybody trying to see her or anything like that you do it like alone in your house no distractions right and that's the timing this is an exercise you need to start working on this long before you you know you have her going absolutely crazy or you want to hand her off to somebody she needs to really understand that it's safe comfortable place to be mm -hmm. Consistency, again, comes down to what are you going to do when she starts to fuss? Now, you've worked on it a little bit. It's starting to go well. If she starts to fuss when someone goes to take her, what's the next step? Yeah. What's what's the next step for uh, Kaya for, for consistency? Uh, sorry, I'm just reading something in the chat. Um, we don't teach our collar and body hold uh, on YouTube. So if you are a uh, person on our online classes or in-house classes, we walk you through that step by step by step. Um, we don't teach it on YouTube because it's a very specific thing. Um, right. And uh, just just so you know that I see some people talking about it. So if you're if you're in classes, we we have all kinds of detailed information about what I've just explained, um, but you will not find it on YouTube. Thanks, Mary okay. H, for the super sticker. I don't remember what you asked me. Sorry. 
<laughs> uh, Kia, what is the consistency? So for consistency, teaching this behavior or, or you know, uh, fixing this uh, unwanted behavior, what happens when uh, Suji starts to, to fuss? When yeah. It's just about repeating the process until the dog is, um, you know, what you don't want to do when the dog's excited is just go, oh, fine, and then just let the dog down because then you're going to have to do it twice as long the, the next time. Um, I do want to say, though, that from speaking from experience, you know, owning a very small dog um, and then also very um, uh, teaching lots of people small dogs, I definitely suggest that you work on the holding thing that I've that I've talked about, but also how to sit on a loose leash on the floor as well. One of the best things that I did with Hippie Shake was not treat her like she was a seven pound toy poodle. Yeah. She knows how to do all of the big dog stuff. She has been able to build a lot of confidence, being able to do things like sit at my side or you know lie at my side. And she's able to do a lot of the things and it's because I didn't baby her. Um, obviously I'm very careful because she's little and I have to be aware of my surroundings a bit more with a dog like her than I do my bigger dogs. Um, but I think that it's important to do both things. For sure. Um, we have some more. Some Okay, let's talk about this one. From uh, Deborah. Uh, my dog wants to stay outside all the time. She doesn't really want her company. I wanted a pet. She is a dog. Let's talk a little bit about um, the what's happening here and uh, what you can, the, the steps that you can take to have your dog come in when you call them to come in. You know, have your dog sort of hang out and be a little bit more of a pet uh, than feeling like your dog is just completely disinterested in you. So let's talk a little bit about staying outside all the time. How do you, what do you do to, to get a dog inside? Like what's the foundation step? Uh... <laughs> My brain wants to be very realistic right now. You put a leash on the dog and you bring it inside. Absolutely. It's very simple. Yeah, that is um, the foundation. Yeah, so sadly, dogs don't get to do what dogs want to do all of the time. And, um, you know, we don't condone dogs being outside all the time. It sounds like that's not what you want. You want the dog to be inside yeah. with you. Obviously, you are not might not go from, like, the dog wanting to be outside all the time to, like, snuggling in, like, you know, being all lovey-dovey with you on the couch. We might have to take some steps to get there. Um but it is important that we're not allowing the dog to easily make those choices. Um, so the first thing that I would do, so the foundation part of it, is I would work on teaching the dog how to come inside and that that's a rewarding thing to do. I might put a leash on, take the dog outside, practice coming inside, maybe use some food to lure the dog, give them a little jackpot reward when they come in, and I would turn around and I would go right back outside again. And dog's still on leash and I would come back in. And I would go out and in, out and in, and out and in until my dog is happily coming inside because he says, oh my gosh, we come in, we get rewarded, this is so easy. Then I get to go outside again, which I also love. And you have a dog that's really reliably going in. And I would practice that until it becomes effortless for your dog to lay a good foundation. So, uh, you know, you'd mentioned uh, the dog wants to be a dog and doesn't want to be a pet. Well, what what reason have you given your dog to want to be a pet? Mm -hmm. You know, have you shown them that you are worth listening to? Have you shown them that it's valuable? In, it, there's a million different ways to do this too. Let's talk a little bit about management because I think this could solve a leadership problem for a lot of people here on the live stream. Mm -hmm. And um, sometimes we see this. We get students in class or uh, on, uh, uh, online that um, the dog's just like, eh, you know, sometimes I'll listen, but right now, lying in the sun is pretty darn good. So what are like, I don't know, three like little leadership choices that you'd suggest for somebody who's struggling with a dog that's just not that interested in paying attention to them? It just not doesn't feel that they're that valuable. Uh, biggest one is I would have that person control resources for the dog. Yep. Um, and what I mean by that is I would control ways that the dog could potentially make their own decisions and find ways to self-reward them self-reward themselves which takes away from the value of us that could be things like um freedom in the house the ability to go wherever they want in the house uh the ability to go inside and outside the ability to be off leash and to run away from you if they want that ability would be taken away um i might uh control their food by making sure that i'm not free feeding the dog i put the food down for meals and then i take the food up i might even hand feed that dog yeah. to teach them that food literally comes from me and that yeah. it's you know i I'm a valuable person to, to be around because I, I bring the goods. They're excited by that. Um, I might um, be strict about 
um, the dog's uh, location in relationship to me. Things like maybe I would not allow the dog to sleep in the bed or up on the couch at first until my leadership was a little bit more established. My relationship was a little bit more there. I wouldn't be down on the ground roughhousing and playhousing with the dog and then two seconds later expecting the dog to be, you know, listening to me and, and not jumping up all over me. Mm-hmm. Um, I want to try not to give my dogs mixed messages uh, when they're already a little bit teetering on being not really sure about who in the house they should be um, listening to or even who they should be attracted to. Like sometimes the dogs just don't really know who their person or persons are because we don't make it clear enough for them that we are worth being that to them. And this is the foundation for all of the things that are going on in your household. The foundation is I need to show this dog that I'm worth listening to. I need to build some value in their life so that they understand that like I... You know, I'm not just some thing that drops food down when it's dinner time. You mm-hmm. know, I love Kale said one time, um, I want the dog to understand that food comes through me, not from me. And, mm-hmm. do, and you have to understand when you get that, you're like, oh, man, that just that's like a what a gold nugget of information. That is the moment where you realize that like the dog is offering something. The dog is work giving you something. There could be maybe it's like as simple as like checking in with you. It doesn't have to be a complicated thing. Maybe there's checking in with you. And because they did that, they're given a treat. They're, they're rewarded through that. But the food has come through you. It's not just that you're plopping food down on the floor and you're a treat dispenser. They've given you something, so they get something back through you. Well, so, I, I want to add something. Yeah. Um, treats are a great thing. Food's a great thing. I think somebody asked on the chat earlier, should we be keeping food on us all the time? Yes, you can, but don't forget that dog training is not limited to treats. 100%. We are big food trainers. We, we love to use treats in our training, but we also know that food is not where the buck ends in terms of the rewards. As we have also seen dogs who don't have a very um, strong desire to please their person they sometimes are, don't care about taking the food 100%. from them because they're like, Ugh, I'm not taking anything from you. I'm not interested in you, so I'm not going to take food from you. We see dogs take food from one person and refuse taking food from another person because the relationship's weak. Yeah. That person says, I like this person. I'll take food from you, but I don't really like you. You don't do anything for me. So, um, And it's not about whether they like or dislike. It's about whether they respect or not respect that person. Um, so for a person who is struggling with the food aspect, you could use affection. You could use freedom. Um, actually, I saw, I think, um, uh, Sue Ann, I think, I think she might be, um, uh, I think, I think, pretty sure who I think she is. I think she's okay. one of our well, online in. students. Let's... But anyways, I might be getting the, the person wrong and I apologize. I apologize if I, I am because I don't see a picture of the person here. Um, but um, she had a dog that was obsessed with, um, biting weeds outside and couldn't get the dog to stop. So she figured out and the dog, like, I don't know how motivated the dog was by treats. So instead of using food, she would work her recall and then she would give her dog permission to to go and bite the weeds. And then she'd run to the weeds and they'd play in the weeds for a second and then they would work. And when the dog figured out, ha, when I do this for you, I get to do that for me. It was like, it was like a light bulb yeah. went on and the dogs it was so focused on her because it put two and two together. So basically that's a long winded way of saying, don't forget that rewards are not limited to just treats. People hear the word rewards and they just think yeah. food then again, and I, it's not. That's like the default response. Like when we're talking about a lot of these things, cause a lot of people are using food. Yeah. So we, and it's great. Yeah. Oh, 100%. It, it's so good, but that's so not like, where the, not the thing is. Dog. Cause lots of people say, well, I don't want to use food. Also there's, it's fine. There's lots there, of other options you can do. And there are better rewards for some things. Like yeah. when we're talking about building drive for a, uh, you know, a restraint recall for a puppy. You know, using something like our puppy tug, mm-hmm. using a toy, getting the dog engaged, connecting using with chase, them. Using chase, running 100%. away. 100%. Yeah. Letting the dog chase you rather than chasing after something else is a, is a great reward. So let's get to Sue Ann's question. Sue Ann, thank you for the $10 super chat. Our, uh, our Jesse, a mini golden doodle, learned so much from puppy training with you. He is now two and barks at dogs in a dog park when he wants to run with them. Uh, he loves to run. Any advice? So we actually... Um, this is not the person I thought was. Okay. So we actually... Uh, talked a little bit about um i mean this is this is similar uh, to that in in that you're gonna have to get something from the dog before they get something that you want but i'll tell you that one thing that you don't necessarily want is allowing your dog to run with other dogs i mean you just don't it depends a lot on the scenario one thing we'll never do is allow our dogs in a dog park never 
It's just not going to happen. Um, but let's talk a little bit about like barking a dog that's barking out the window, barking at dogs that wants to run with other dogs in the dog park. Where what are the steps that Sue Ann's going to have to take to re- eliminate that behavior? Well, I, I want to talk about the. I want to talk about why we wouldn't let our dogs do what you're wanting them to do. And it kind of sounds like she doesn't want her dog no, to do I this, I which think I think so. is good. Yeah. Um, but, you know, sometimes what happens is people are eager to let their dogs go to the park and run with other dogs. But um, the reason why we don't do it is because we don't know the other dogs and we don't know the friendliness of the other dogs. My dogs spend lots of times with me. Yeah, I walk with friends' dogs multiple times a week and they all get along and they have a lot of fun together. Uh, but... The dogs all have a recall. The dogs all know how to lie down when we ask. They all know to come back with us when we ask. And because they listen well, they're allowed to have the freedom. And so what's happening here is if you have a dog that is barking and saying, I want to go, I want to go, I want to go. And you're saying, come on, you need to go with me. And he's saying, no, 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 no. I want to go, I want to go, I want to go. That's not a dog that's ready to earn the freedom of going to run. So um, first things first for the foundation thing is you need to make sure that you have worked on an alternative option that you can use in this scenario. Um, It could be um, holding a sit at your side on a loose leash and looking at you. It could be um, responding to their name and moving with you as you walk away. It could be performing a trick like a hand tap or shake a paw. It could be tugging on a toy. It doesn't matter. It needs to be something that the dog is doing with and for you yeah. that you can do instead to get that dog back on track so that their focus isn't entirely on what they want to do but now what they want to do with you because you've now trained them and and worked on the foundation to make this other thing lots of fun so now you can redirect your dog's mind frame to something that's a bit more productive and you don't need to have a a big discussion with them when it comes to timing for things like this sue ann i want you to think about you know how close are you to the dog park how are how close are you to the distractions before your dog starts to bark um you know you're going to i've talked again about this before but there's that those concentric circles where your dog is going to fail where they're likely to fail and then where they're absolutely not going to fail you're going to work around the point you're going to start at the point where they're definitely not going to be distracted by the other dogs and slowly close that distance in toward the distraction where your dog is probably going to be successful maybe not if not you can work through it and Mm -hmm. you can always remove them back to that distance this makes what you're going to see and i I love uh kale's suggestion this makes me think of dogs that chase cars and what ultimately we create the behavior we create for those Mm -hmm. dogs who chase cars so uh in a couple of instances we've had dogs that uh, love to chase cars and we'll work with them and we'll Mm -hmm. teach them to lie down and what's so funny is that the McCann Professional Dog Trainers uh, training facility is like 22 acres, U- beautiful, huge property. But we go out for a walk with the dogs, and then all of a sudden one of the dogs will lie down, and we're like, what on mm-hmm. earth? And then a car, car goes, goes by. by. We didn't even realize it, but ultimately that's what we've worked in. Because, the conditioning. Yeah, the dog's been conditioned to lie down in that situation because you've followed the steps that Kale talked about. You've given your dog something else to do, something that involves you, and you've done it so often that now the dog thinks, ooh, there's that distraction. There's so much value in me engaging with that person or doing that behavior in the case of a lie down. Mm -hmm. And then that, with the timing with that, it needs to be, in order for the dog to learn something like that, like for a dog to learn to Uh, associate a car coming by with lying down you need to get your dog lying down within one second of the car coming by remember that one second time rule we talked about before or if you walk by a dog park and the dogs you know your dog starts to bark and pull towards that thing you need to be working on um getting your dog to do a different behavior within a second of approaching that distraction so the dog starts to pair that together with this if you're taking too long to get a reaction or and that sometimes will happen if your distraction is too strong like ken had suggested um you need to make sure that your timing uh, that your timing is there and then of course consistency and i think that one sort of explains itself just like we've been saying if you're um you know allowing the dog to bark and pull all of the time when you go by those distractions and you're not always addressing it um it's just going to take too long to fix your problem. You have to be consistent. Dan Lotzling Fluten dropped in the super chat. Uh, he said, I want to see my buddy Grand Slam. Oh. Um, the other thing I want you to think about. Are you Wait. okay to get him? You want me to go? I'm sorry. Okay. Um, the other thing I want you to think about, and again, it, you know, we're speaking specifically to the issue of dogs, uh, uh, you know, a dog barking at other dogs in a dog park. But um, when it comes to any of your problem behaviors, so barking at dogs in a dog park, 
you're not going to go out and uh, walk your dog and maybe or maybe not it's going to happen. You are going to go out and walk your dog in a situation where you're not worried about the dog park. And then you're going to go, maybe you're going to go back, you're going to go back to the dog park specifically to work on this skill because it's been an ongoing struggle. Hi, buddy. Hi, Weenie. It's Grand Slam. Actually, I think Sue K dropped a uh, Grand Slam sticker in the uh, chat as well. Weenie boy. But, but you're going to go out of your way to work on these things because, you know, you're going to be in the right frame of mind. You're not going to be tired. You're not going to be rushed. You're going to put yourself in the situation where we're going to train through this. You know, we're going to work on this. And um, that's going to put you so much farther ahead than you were before because you're being intentional and you're being a lot more critical of the choices that you're making because you're not thinking oh boy okay i gotta get back for the kids are off the bus at three or you know I've, i'm late for my meeting or whatever you're gonna you're gonna devote that time to work on this skill foundation uh, and fairness timing and consistency can be applied to just about every one of your unwanted behaviors and, and this barking at the dog park is absolutely no different okay we need to find another one uh Mm. Okay, this isn't, I mean, that's not really, it's not really on topic. Well, you're looking for something. Somebody says, so puppy play dates are in the ba other dog in a backyard is okay or no? Um, so, yeah, it is okay as long as it's controlled. So, and that the dog that you're having interact with your dog is going to be well matched. You need to make sure, the thing, the thing that's dangerous about this is a lot of people don't know about how to read body language. And so if you have a real softy and then you're allowing them to play with a dog that's going to like pumble them over all the time, you might teach dogs to be a little bit worried about other dogs, or maybe you have the dog that's a bully. Um, if they're well matched with one another, that's a great way to teach them to interact with other dogs really well. But, you know, anytime we have young puppies that we're trying to you know, get them around other dogs and get them more comfortable with it. We do it in a very controlled manner. We have, you know, the dogs on leash. We'll let them play for a few moments. And then we practice calling them away. We practice more time with the puppy engaging with us. And then we let them play for a short period of time. And then we call them away. We just don't let them go play. And then we sit and, you know, talk and don't think about them anymore. Yeah. It's all about training and teaching. And if we feel that something is not going to be in either dog's best interest, we stop the play from there. The other thing we do is if we uh, get to the point where we can't call our dogs away from one another and they're not listening to our voices, then we don't give them the freedom to go and play off leash because we don't want to be chasing the puppies and like having us call their name a million times right. and the puppies just ignoring us. So sometimes you can really screw up your recall by, um, you know, giving the dog a little bit too much freedom and then they learn not to, to hang out. My best friend has a... Um, a puppy that's a very similar age to my puppy and we used to get together every single week and we would let our puppies play but they would play for about two minutes and then we would do about 20 minutes of obedience training where we would walk them close to each other and then work leave it and yeah. we would work sit stays side by side and the puppies are just the best of friends now it's five alive and my friend's dog's name is smooch and um they're best of buddies now and uh, they do play sometimes but they've also learned to listen around one another so we can hike them and we can go paddle boarding with them we can do all kinds of things and the dogs just learn how to how to get along and how to listen at the same time instead of just forgetting we exist so that's massively helpful for somebody with a puppy um and we're kind of reverse engineering we're avoiding the behavior problems yeah. because you're giving the dog a solid foundation you're being fair about teaching them that mm. like here here are our expectations and if you make this choice as we work through this here's the great things that can happen uh, i mean the timing gets included into that the timing with your training the timing with turning the dog away and you're consistent you're you're being consistent by not letting the dogs the puppy puppies engage with each other because you know that it's going to be pretty gratifying and for we them. knew like the consistency was easy because we knew based on the dog's behavior that if we let them off the leashes yep. they were not going to be running back to us because they were in training they just weren't ready for that yet and we weren't prepared to do that and there was a few times where we would let them play and we would call them and one of them wouldn't listen and they would have long lines on and we would go and get the line and we would stop them so they couldn't rehearse it and then we would say okay they weren't ready for that let's train a little bit longer and then we'll give it another try until the point got where we could you know give them the freedom and still have the control so it does take time and it takes work super chat from norman also knows consistency norman yeah norman nelson 
Uh, what are your steps for dogs barking Hi, Norma. with noise or uh, with noise outside or people that come to the door? I just can't seem to get uh, to get a handle on this. Grr on me. Well, number one, that's uh, a frustrating thing for sure. One hundred percent. Subscribe to the McCann Dogs Music Channel. We actually have a channel here on YouTube, and we have channels on Spotify. I can't imagine Norma doesn't. And Apple Music. I know Norma's uh, for sure. But um, that's an opportunity for anybody who's looking for like ambient sound that reduces the uh, abruptness of Avoidance, some of that experience yeah. of Avoidance exterior sound. Thing. We worked with uh, digital music collaborators to make music that's specific for dogs and we have uh, two live streams always running on the McCann Dogs music channel actually at the end of this live stream I'm gonna jump us out I'm gonna uh, I'll, I'll bounce us over there so if you're not sure what that is uh, you can go check out the channel but mm -hmm. let's talk a little bit about some of the steps that Norma can take uh, yeah. outside of that this one hits very close to home because I've actually been having some issues with five alive with this same thing he's been going through a bit of a spooky period uh, just with being young and um, with the amount of times that the Amazon guy comes to our house there is lots of time for us to practice somebody uh, coming outside um, and what I have found uh, that works quite well is giving the dog an alternative behavior sometimes if you just get after them and you're saying quiet quiet that's enough and the dog's already in that mental mind frame where they're stimulated whether they're worried or whether they're excited or whatever it is they're high high minded regardless of the reason it, sometimes um, even though you're saying knock it off that's enough or you're taking the leash it sometimes doesn't affect change because the dog's just not in a working mind frame in that moment they're just they're buzzed or they're stimulated um so what we need to do is something that's going to get the dog to come down and get into a little bit more of a responsive state um one thing that i find works very very well with my dog um is i will tell him to leave it and i will immediately tell him to do something else mm -hmm. and um one of the things that works best with him is to tell him to go and lie on his bed um because we have done so much work with going and lying on the bed and he just he thinks that is like the most fun game ever that literally the moment we say on your bed he goes to the bed and he lies and like he's like okay you're gonna feed me and like the mind frame changes almost immediately um if i don't have a bed near me i will just tell him okay you know go and lie down or have him get in and sit or i'll have him do a left or right spin or i'll have him do shake a paw or i also taught, taught a nose tap i'll do something that gets him doing something for me that i know he enjoys that i know he knows really really well um so that i can um get him into a different mind frame and more often than not within a few moments of asking me to do something else he will look back at what that thing is but now he does it quietly right. he'll look he's still interested he's he's not ignoring the, that the person's there but he'll just sort of check it out and then when he does it quietly I now have a chance to reward him I now can say good boy good quiet that's better because I've changed the mind frame so um, that only works if you've done the foundational training uh, to teach the dog to do something else instead and figuring out what that thing is the bed thing might not be what's perfect for your dog normal but um, think about what could could happen what you could use for your dog it would be a good alternative a lot of the conversation tonight has been about uh, young dogs and they need a foundation of learning yes. and i think there's a great opportunity for you at home to do some foundation every time you do this i'm never in the dogs. thing and i'm also too high i'll just do this <laughs> Uh, yes. So um, we do have a couple really great online programs. So if you're not training with us online, uh, we do have a program called Puppy Essentials. It's for dogs that are under four months old. And then we have a program called Life Skills for a dog that's over four months old. And um, basically the, the purpose of these programs is to give you a specialized program that you can follow that is a lot more um, structured than random videos that you see on YouTube um, so that you actually have a plan to follow. But the absolute best part of it is that you get instructor support every single step of the way. Um, something that we have worked really, really hard on before putting any online classes out is figuring a way that we could bring our quality interaction and support that we have in our in-person classes to our online students. We did not want it to be just a video that you watch and you have to do it by yourself. We really, truly get to know you and your dogs and we're able to give you specific advice. So if you're following the cookie cutter thing and it's not working, you're able to connect with us. You're able to send us a video. You're able to ask us a question and we can say, okay, for Norma, you and this dog, you're going to do this a little bit differently. And then we're, we're able to have that back and forth. We have weekly live um, coaching calls. Um, we have support groups where you get to connect and you know interact with all the other students in the um, program, which are all over the world. It really is such an awesome, awesome program um, that is very different than a lot of the other online programs that are out there. 
Beth Shapiro asks, says, nipping is the most frustrating thing. This is something that we get uh, often, Beth. Uh, it is frustrating. We're trying the interventions, and she's sometimes getting the idea, but I think she's a very assertive puppy by temperament, uh, very different from our last dog. So let's talk about the foundation and what's fair to expect of a puppy that's come home. Because puppies are going to nip. Yeah, puppies are going to nip. It, it, all puppies will nip and bite. They're trying to figure out, you know, how to communicate with you and sometimes they're learning about you know when they're in a in a litter of puppies all together they don't speak english to one another or speak any language to one another they communicate through their their mouths and their body language and so you know you can have to understand when a puppy comes into your household and they want something or they don't want something their first instinct is to use um their mouth on you um, and sometimes it's playful and sometimes it's bratty. Uh, either way, regardless of the reason, it's not the way that we want our dogs to communicate with us. So it is something that we need to address, but it yeah. is it is very, very normal and there's nothing wrong with your puppy for doing it. But also at the same time, we want everyone to understand that it's not okay. A lot of people will use the, oh, he's just a puppy or he's met chewing, he's um, teething, he needs to go outside, he wants something right. as an excuse. Right. And what we're trying to tell you is that there's actually so many other ways that puppies could communicate those things to you without ever putting their mouth on your skin or on your clothing yeah um, the timing when are you going to do something about that so also you know have you worked your did you talk a little bit about this I was doing other stuff have you have you given your puppy puppy enough exercise you know have you put your puppy in a situation where they're not up on the couch where they're not up in your arms yeah. and if they're a wild and crazy biter they're likely more likely to do those things at those times yeah that's a good point we see a lot of times when we start um, asking our students more about like what's going on at home and when the biting's happening so often we find that the people without knowing it are putting their puppies into situations where they're almost provoking the nipping. They're almost putting the puppy in a situation where it's so easy for them to make poor choices. And then you end up having to tell your puppy no, 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 no all of the time. And that's really not not what we want you to have to do. We want be, you to be able to focus on the good stuff rather than on the bad stuff. Um, so it is important to note that you're not putting your puppy in situations where it's easy for them to nip and bite like many of the things that Ken had just mentioned. Yeah. Can you pass me my water? Yeah, yeah. Water? And being consistent about this just means you're you're prepared. If you have a puppy with a nipping and biting problem, they should definitely be wearing a house line every time they're and out of the And you should be utilizing crate. a crate more. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So um, that they don't aren't free all the time to just fly to nowhere and grab your house coat, your slippers, or whatever it might be. Um, you know, they're there and they're in a crate or they're out and you're watching them so you're able to give them good information with good timing. One of the things that can make this really tough and I hear there's a lot and it's usually a, a student who has a husband or boyfriend spouse at home who's like oh I love it I don't care if the dog chews on me you know it's great I think so it's annoying. yeah it's part of whatever having a dog um, that can make things really difficult and totally for, tubular, for your dog oh, totally tubular <laughs> um, it can make it really difficult for your dog because it's in you're not thinking about the consistency. Foundation and fairness, we've talked about that. The timing, you know, you've got great timing. You have uh, the management tools in place, but consistency is crucial. Whether it's your kids, your friends and family, your spouse, whatever, whoever it is, um, you need to, there needs to be like a through line in the house, rules that we don't allow the puppy to do this, the puppy can do this. You know, mm -hmm. when the puppy starts to do this, this next step happens. Um, that's how the consistency works in our household. And it's people are so amazed when we have these young dogs and they're like absolutely brilliant little things. And um, it's because we were very clear and consistent about our expectations with our dog. And we're not mean about it. No, we're just, absolutely we're not. We're just clear about it. Yeah. And, you know, somebody asked me the other day, how, many how long did it take you to stop five from nipping and biting? And I said, he never really did any nipping and biting. No, no. And they were flabbergasted at that. And the reason for that is not because he had some crazy discipline in his life. Right. It's because he was not in scenarios where he could nip and bite me because I'm always training. I'm always showing him what I want him to do instead. And we're really developing that working relationship where he learns from an early age to respect me and love me. And dogs who feel that way about a human are not interested in putting their mouth on them Absolutely. because they see them as a, as a leader. And I was able to do that just through training him. Um, and that's what we suggest that you do. Um, this is funny. Uh, Sue K, one of our Hard Talk supporters. Uh, this is when Kale's advice about training husbands <laughs> comes in handy. I don't know. Have you guys seen that? Well, That's I do funny. have. I do have some husband training advice sometimes that I share from yeah. time to time. It's a. Uh, I don't know if this is the place for it though. No. <laughs> That's funny, Sue. 
<laughs> so talking about um, uh, specifically, I saw digging and chewing. Uh, who who said that, Linda? So Linda, we did talk a little bit about that in the course of this stream. But uh, the three steps are going to be foundation of fairness. You know, what is your dog? What is your, what have you taught your dog to do instead of those things? And when it comes to digging, digging is a common one. I work uh, I work uh, full time as a firefighter as well, and uh, I get a lot of phone calls at my station uh, during the day uh, with dog training questions. I'd say one of the most common has got to be digging in the yard or barking in the yard. So let's go through what are they three doing steps. in the yard? Yeah. So let's go through three <laughs> steps talking about digging or barking when it comes out when we're talking about in the yard. And I can sell it to, I can send it to everybody at uh, my fire hall or my fire uh, department and I will tell them just to watch this clip. Yeah. Um, well, the foundation of the fairness is <laughs> what I was going to say is uh, sort of tongue in cheek. Why are, why are they in the yard? Yeah. Because the way that we see it is that if they're in the yard you should be in the yard so that when said digging or barking happens, you're there to do something about it, which is going to get into the timing and consistency, which we'll talk about in a second. But so often we don't set our dogs up fairly to make a good choice because we put them out in the yard and then we go back inside to finish eating our breakfast or to do whatever we need to. And now all of a sudden we're busy doing something and we hear the dog barking at the fence outside or we come out and there, there's a giant hole and we've totally missed it because we weren't paying attention. Well, that dog's not ready to be able to be in that scenario. And this isn't this isn't forever. No. This is just while you have a problem. Yeah. You know, before you, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, that, that's, so that, that's so true. I was going to say that about the crate too. Some people, somebody, I think somebody said in the thing, I'm not giving my dog enough crate time. Remember, this is all during training. You know, yeah. Slam's never in a crate unless I'm at work or he's in the car. Yeah. That's, uh, and, and he's at work with me because I yeah. teach at a dog school and he can't just roam around the dog school. But when he's home, he's never in a crate because we trust him explicitly. But he grew up being in a crate until he was able to be trained. Same thing, you know, he can be outside in our fenced yard and I know he's not gonna bark, I know he's not gonna try and get out, I know he's not gonna dig um, because I've been out with him long enough to go through those steps to teach him that those things are not okay and now I don't have to worry about it. But people end up giving their dogs so much opportunity to make poor choices, then the dog rehearses those poor choices, and then we say, well, why does my dog love digging? Well, he's been allowed to dig for a really long time. Mm -hmm. Slam doesn't really know he loves to dig because he's not really done it very much. He doesn't know that he likes to bark at people going by the street because he's never done it very much. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're trying to get at here. You need to make sure that foundationally, you're not setting your dog up to learn so many bad things so that you then have to work on back backtracking it, which some of you may have to do, and that is okay. Okay, but the ultimate goal is to um, not put them, fairly set them in a situation where they're not going to make poor choices so much. I see a lot of questions about leash, lun like lunging on leash and barking at other dogs on leash. Now, uh, it's, it kind of depends on how uh, severe the case is. We don't talk a lot about like aggression or fear or that kind of stuff here on the channel because we do a much better, uh, we have a better opportunity to help you with your training in a private lesson or something like that. Mm -hmm. But um, when it comes to foundation and fairness, when you're talking about leash, leash lunging and barking, uh, as Kale mentioned, well, you shouldn't you shouldn't be putting your dog in a if they have a problem that's like that and it's really frustrating and it's not getting better you must stop putting them in a situation where they can rehearse that kind of thing mm -hmm. the timing comes down to at what point is your dog going to leave you f to bark at that thing to lunge at those people and whether it's friendly or aggressive or whatever you don't want it and you're going to stop it you're going to learn how to stop it yeah so you know you have to work we talked about those concentric circles i don't know when when you uh joined the live stream but we talked about that point when your dog is going to fail and maybe that's eight feet maybe it's 15 feet maybe it's 160 feet i don't care what that distance is you need to be working from and showing your dog to pay attention to you to maybe turn or uh just give just not be so focused on that other thing you need to be working in that green zone, in that safety zone where you're never going to fail, and then slowly make your way into that more challenging zone where it's tougher for your dog, but you've got things under control. You're focused on what they're doing, what they're looking at. You're focused on how far away that distraction is. The foundation of this exercise needs to be that you've shown them that there's value in just walking beside you. You've shown them that there's value that when they don't look at, at bark or lunge at those other dogs, it's way better. There's something in yeah. it for sure to check in with you. That's where the foundation and, and value, uh, foundation and fairness comes in. Mm -hmm. It's unfair to keep rehearsing that barking and pulling for your dog, and in fact, for the other dog that they're barking yeah. and pulling at. So I want you to really take that seriously uh, when we talk about those kinds of things. It's very fixable, mm -hmm. but you need to make you need to be 
focused on fixing it. Yeah. We had a And co- you need time to teach the Absolutely. dog that a different behavior yeah. is valuable because some behaviors are take a lot longer to teach or it takes longer for the to, dog to learn that sitting at your side on a loose leash is actually more fun than jumping at another dog. That's that's not a natural thing yeah. that the dog thinks is fun, but if we can train it and teach the dog that that's a good thing and they think like, "Oh, we're playing that thing where we get to the side and we look at you or whatever the situation is." Um, you'll have a much better uh, time being able to use those skills when you're out and about in scenarios where your dog is more prone to making good choices. But you're not going to have that success if you continue putting your dog in a scenario where they're going to make poor choices when you haven't had the time to build up the other part of it yet. Yeah, you're going to go out, you know, you're going to stop going on walks and you're going to go out on training sessions because, I mean, I guess it depends how often it's happening. You're going to figure out other ways to exercise your dog, get them to engage with you. But now you're going to go out uh, and and intentionally train. You're not going to you're not going to uh, hope that you meet somebody on the street. You're going to set up some distraction. Mm-hmm. You're going to work somewhere that you can control those distractions a little bit better. And you're going to work your butt off. And you're going to be so happy when your dog stops pulling. You're going to be so excited and, and, and you're going to appreciate your walk so much more when you're walking down the street and somebody's coming and your dog's just like, okay, what now? Okay, what's up? That's that's really what you want and that's where you can get. But it's going to you're going to have to be intentional about it mm-hmm. and focus on the foundation, the timing, and being consistent. That's the only way to really affect any change. Uh, that's that's going to be valuable. Mm-hmm. That dog that I had um, that I was training that really liked chasing cars, it was a long time where we just did a lot of our walks in my driveway. Yeah. And we did it close to the house where I wasn't so close to the road where the cars would be going by because she just couldn't she couldn't choose paying attention to me over the cars at first until I was able to train it a bit more. And then over time, I was able to work at the very end of my driveway and cars could come by and we could work on being able to to stay focused. And then we would then take the show on the road and go for a walk. And there was times where I would think she was ready to go for a walk and I would walk really awesome for a week. And then all of a sudden she'd have some regression and I would have to backtrack and go back and, and go back to some of the earlier progressions where she was more successful. That is normal. That is dog training. Dogs are not robots and they need, you know, they need a lot of time to rep, a lot of time and repetition on things in order for it to actually solidify and be reliable. Uh, the tarot mom, uh, you know, tips for dominant, uh, dog dominant energy in the house. See some members as, uh, some family members as food dealers instead of uh, <laughs> owners. We talked a little bit about that. Scrub back in the live stream. We have a great, there's a great moment for you in the stream where we talk a little bit about food coming through you mm-hmm. or through people instead of from you. Now, uh, does your dog listen to music? Like, do, do you play music for your dog when you're leaving the house? Because it can be super valuable. And give your dog... We do. We do. Uh, we yeah, do. Well, especially when we're Don't traveling. We. But it gives your dog that opportunity to, like, sort of yeah, settle in. Yeah, hotel not, rooms. Absolutely. All the time. Airbnbs. Yeah. Everything. So we made our own. And I'm going to send you guys right to that. Now, with all of the teaching, all of the training, all of the things that we've talked about tonight, the rest, my friends, well, that is up to you. Happy training. Oh. We do these live streams to educate you, but more importantly, to motivate you. You can have the dog that you've always wanted, but it's just going to take you a little bit of work. I would know because I was just like you. Long before I became a dog trainer, I was a frustrated dog owner, but the skills that I learned at McCann's changed my life. Now, we have hundreds of videos here on our YouTube channel to help you to have a well-behaved four-legged family member. But if you want someone to guide you through the dog training process, then you should check out our Puppy Essentials program for puppies under six months. If your dog is over six months, then you could join our Life Skills program, and our instructors are going to help to make sure that everything goes as smoothly as possible in a really supportive environment. All of the knowledge about dog training in the world won't help you to be successful unless you get up and you start training. The real question is, what are you going to train next? Happy training.